Welcome to the 51st episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. I'm your host, Mark Hassera. For over 24 years, I was in the Air Force as a tanker pilot flying KC-135s all over the world. My lifelong passion has been airplanes and aviation. Since I was a five-year-old kid standing on the hood of my Grandpa Andy's car watching Boeing 707s and Douglas DC-8s take off and land out of Los Angeles International Airport, I have loved airplanes. And now for 60 years, airplanes and aviation aviation have been my passion in life. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we debrief some of the most fascinating and intriguing pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. Our purpose is to investigate some of these tactics, techniques, and procedures these aviators created or cultivated during those extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and even private flying events and operations. This exploration gives our listeners practical advice on how does the aviation world work and expands critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. But it also gives a lot of our veterans an opportunity to tell their incredible stories. This episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit show is sponsored by Wall Pilot, aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These are four, six, or eight foot ready to print and even custom vinyl graphics of aircraft that you can peel off and stick to the walls of your home, office, or hangar. A lot of people just frame them the way that they are. But go to wallpilot.com and you can see up to 127 ready to print. Or we can do a custom one for you with your name, weapons load, squadron and wing emblems, tail number on a personalized graphic of your airplane. On today's episode of Lessons from the Cockpit, I have somebody I've wanted to interview for a very long time. Bio. F-14 Tomcat Rio. Many of you have probably read his books. Dave Barnack is going to be with us today on the Lessons from the Cockpit show. So, grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show talking about flying Tomcats instructing in Top Gun, and being in the first movie with my good friend, Bio. Dave Baranak, Bio, welcome to the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. Hey, Sluggo, thanks for having me. I've been uh, waiting for a chance to get to be on your program and talk to your audience. You're doing great work here. Well, I appreciate that, man, but... Uh... Having people like you on, you know, it's like I'm not worthy, you know. You've uh, <laughs> a Tomcat Rio, Top Gun instructor, three books out now. I mean, you've done a lot of uh, incredible work. So let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get your flying bug? How did you get your love for flying and then get into the Navy and start doing it? You know, as uh, since my books came out and I and I did uh, have done interviews and stuff, I've thought back about that, and I wish I could think of a specific incident where I got the flying bug. But I think it was just a culmination of growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, and my parents took us to air shows. And in Jacksonville, you know, we had the Blue Angels all the time. The Thunderbirds showed up once in a while. And just around the time I was 10 or 11 years old, something like that, I just wanted to be a fighter pilot. And I remember before that, I wanted to do different things or I thought about it. And then once I thought about this fighter pilot, I never changed my mind. That's what took hold at the right age. And I stayed on that path. For years, I, I wasn't sure whether I went Air Force or Navy or, you know, which one I would want to go till it got time to go to college. And I had to make a decision in terms of ROTC for a ROTC scholarship. And I, I talked to my dad about it and I ended up going Navy. And for me, I think that was a good decision because as soon as I got to college, my eyesight started to go bad. So there was no way I was going to be a pilot, but I still wanted to fly fighters and the Navy's the F-14 was brand new at that time. And so I, I changed my goal to being an F-14 Rio. As I tell people, no, it's it's not a fighter pilot, but also it's still challenging and competitive to complete the training and get selected for Tomcats and all that other stuff. And so it was, you know, you don't designate yourself a Rio. You tell the Navy, that's what I want to do. And then they put you through the whole program. And if, you know, and if you meet their standards, whatever. So anyway, I became an F-14 Rio. Everything everything worked out. I put in the time. I had some ability and uh, and it worked out. Oh, man. And, and you got into the Tomcat 
community fairly early. The airplanes coming in, the early A models, Phoenix missiles. I mean, the whole works. When I started my Tomcat training was 1980. So the Tomcat had been in the fleet about five, about six years. A lot of the instructors in the RAG, which is the F-14 training squadron, had been, you know, had Vietnam combat flights in the Phantom. Oh, also, a good number of them were in the first few F-14 squadrons, and some of the stories they had, one, about the problems they had to figure out, like the Tomcat, you know, like engine problems, but also flap and spoiler things and stuff like that. But also, you probably talked to old guys who flew in the 70s and stuff. The flying that those guys did was amazing. amazing. I mean, they, it was like the Wild West. And you know what? That, Even in Strategic yeah. Air Command, imagine this. In Strategic Air Command, we could do what's called off-station trainers, and we could like rent a jet for a weekend. And we had a crew that went down to Roosevelt Roads when one of the air wings was doing their workups and was down there refueling at Roosevelt Roads for a week. There was so much stuff you could get away with back then. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, man. You'd be in jail if you tried now. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I'm a rag student and and we're listening to these guys talk about all this stuff. And uh, of course, you know, we got the message. It wasn't like that anymore. You couldn't do the things that they talked about, you know, take off and climb overhead Miramar at 10,000 feet and and wait to jump people as they took off and stuff like that. You couldn't do that stuff, but still it was it got you fired up. And it also, you know, I mean, those guys, they were enthusiastic, they were warriors, but they were also good trainers. I mean, they yeah. they told us what we had to do. For me, it was a, uh, a good time to, to join Tomcats. But let me tell you something else, Sluggo. My last F-14 fleet experience was in 1998. And the young guys that were coming through then, they had a world of different experience, but they still had the enthusiasm the professionalism, et cetera. So hopefully, you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure you see new Air Force guys now or yeah. and maybe Navy and, and Marine Corps yeah. guys. And I hope you see the same thing. They still have that enthusiasm, uh, even though the world is different. Much different. But yet, you know what? I noticed that they all still, you're right. They have the same kind of enthusiasm. But you know what, too, Bile? They have the same dedication, too. Yeah. The same dedication to the mission, particularly now because we don't fight wars, you know, the Air Force doesn't just go off and do its thing. It's joint. It's all yeah. about jointness. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's one of the other key things that has become a great attribute of the military is we know how to do the joint thing now. And we were kind of forced into it, you know, and I can remember being at the chaos during Allied Force and we're like looking at each other going, okay, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And I agree with you. I think you, uh, you, hit the nail on the head, you know, Vietnam, there was very little inter-service interaction. And then, as you said, and we were forced into it. And I think we do it pretty well now, in my experience. Yeah, I, I talked to, get this, I talked to a guy, Spliff Russell, who was in an F-15E strike eagle covering a SEAL team on top of Tackergar. He was covering Roberts Ridge. Uh-huh. Had, never, had never fired the gun at a ground target and had never done a closer support mission until he was forced into it. And yet he said, our guys are in trouble and we're here to help. Yeah. And we're going to do it. Yep. And I think that's one of the joint things that <clears throat> we've all come to realize now is this is the way we're going to fight. So, so you cover your training in your first book, you know, before Top Gun days, talk to us a little bit about what a Rio goes through in his initial training, his or her initial training as you are going through school and then getting an assignment to Tomcats. Okay. The, uh, we, we called it flight school back when I went through in 1979 and 80, which was in the last century. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is because at that time they did not teach uh, backseaters how to fly an airplane. I don't know if they do that at all right now because there's no real point in it. You understood how to fly an airplane because we went to aerodynamics class and all and, you know, all these other things. They didn't teach us how to to do the stick and throttle thing, though. Uh, But on the other hand, we were flying in uh, uh, training airplanes that had dual controls. And so uh, oftentimes an instructor would say, do you want to fly for a few minutes? And so you could you would get a little bit of sick time, especially depending on how your training flight went. But. The syllabus when I was there started with uh, basic airways navigation, 
And then it went to uh, things like low level uh, navigation. And this was all before GPS. So we had to use uh, tack ends and then we had to use visual navigation out, out the window and charts and everything. And these, I thought these were all good skills. And then you moved into the uh, Rio training squadron where they taught you all kinds of different uh, air intercepts on a basic radar. And so we had simulators and we had training aircraft so that this, the uh, progression there was lecture, simulator, aircraft. To do the stuff that I just told you, you know, airways navigation, low levels, and uh, radar intercepts and stuff, it took, and then a little bit of maneuvering combat, that took, um, I'm thinking back in uh, about uh, 10 to 11 months. At that point, uh, Rio got his wings and uh, went off to the F-14 training squadron where they continued to train you on the mission as well as on the aircraft. And I'll say something else uh, because, because people may wonder, you know, what's a, what's a Rio like in a squadron? Every stage of the training from Pensacola to my very last flight in the F-14, the Rio had to have the same systems knowledge as the pilot. When we took our uh, NATOPS tests, which is, uh, you know, I guess yeah. that's your dash one. And, yeah. and, and we had bold face procedures. The Rio had to know every single word of bold face procedures exactly like a pilot did. He had to know the aircraft engine limit, hydraulic pressure, and hundreds of other things. The Rio took the same test. So uh, in that case, I thought the Navy did a good job because they made the Rio, um, you know, responsible crewman. Yeah. You weren't just sitting back there waiting to, you know, for the mission. You were part of the crew. And so I, I appreciated that. And in the F-14, in the way it has been discussed with me, the Rio is who runs the mission. The uh, What was it somebody told me once? You know, the pilot uh, rows the boat, but the Rio shoots the ducks. Uh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, that that's pretty good. Um, I would say that that is maybe a little bit of a generalization because yeah. there were times when I would be flying and, and the uh, pilot would be the um, mission commander or the strike leader. Yeah, good point. So in that case, the pilot would, would uh, do a lot of that. But the mm -hmm. Rio was doctrinally responsible for navigation and communication. And so, yeah, he did a lot of, of running the mission. But but um you know, as just like Air Force pilots, many Navy pilots are, are single seaters. Tomcat pilots could easily be single seaters, so they can navigate and communicate. But in the F-14, you know, they they had a Rio to do that. Yeah. So that was the Rio's job. The Rio had yeah. to lead for that. It was really uh, a real a cool air crew concept, shared responsibility. It was a it was a great environment if it worked well, if it worked well. <laughs> yeah. You know, I there know. were a few guys that, you know, were hard to get along with or whatever they, but they're, they're the exceptions, Sluggo, you yeah. know, just like on any crew. Oh, I, and looking back at my career, there was, <laughs> I went through the same thing. Okay. There was people you liked and people you loved, as we used to say. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah. That's <laughs> people good. you liked and people you loved crews that you loved flying with. And it was just, a thrill to come into work and fly with a particular crew. But, uh, yep. and you got to see the F-14 evolve oh, from yeah. being air superiority to actually dropping bombs. Didn't you? That is something that, you know, I, I couldn't believe it when it actually happened because when we were strictly air to air, air superiority. Oh, good. And, and this is going to lead me to a, a comment, which I'll make after the, after the evolution thing. You know, when we, were, when we were air to air, we were, I don't know, maybe like F-15C guys. It's like, oh, pff, air to ground, you know, the bomb always hits the ground. What's the hard part? You know, and that, you know, yeah. derisive remarks and stuff like that. When the community went air to ground, I'll tell you what, they embraced it. And they, they wanted to do the job professionally. They accepted the challenge. Uh, and so it was, you know, it's very professional. So you used a correct term for the F-14, air superiority. I, you know, I, I go online sometimes on Facebook and there's other, and every once in a while you'll see someone make the declaration that the Tomcat, oh, remember the Tomcat was designed uh, for fleet air defense or was designed as an interceptor. And I engage a lot of those people and I say that it, that's demonstrably not true. And if you look back at at Grumman, at, you look back at the Navy's requirements and specifications, you look back at Grumman's material, 
the Tomcat was the Navy's air superiority fighter. It had to be able to do the fleet air defense interceptor mission, but it was intended, it was the strike escort fighter, it was the MiG sweep fighter, and it had every lesson from Vietnam that they could incorporate in the airframe. So, you know, it was, it was a, uh, it was an air superiority fighter uh, when it started. And nobody. So thanks for using it. that term. <laughs> uh, well, and, and it was great at what it did. And yeah, I, I, I got to fly the D model sim at Oceana with a Rio by the name of Rob Osterhout, Wimbo. He showed me all the different things that, you know, the D model could do. Of course, you know, it had a different radar and stuff like that, but holy smokes, man, launching a Phoenix missile at a target 90 miles away. <laughs> okay. You know, and I remember being part of an exercise that we did with carrier air wing five when I was stationed at Kadena. Yeah. And the first thing, the very first thing that the F-15 guys put in the rule book for our uh, combined exercise, yeah. F-14s can't use Phoenix. <laughs> that was yep. the very first thing they go, no, you can't use that. You can't use that. And it was like, <laughs> that's well, what they do. You know, it you depends know? on what the purpose of the exercise is yeah. and stuff like that. Because I remember we, when I was a junior officer, we hosted an F-15 squadron. I, I don't even remember which one it was. The last day we said the only weapon, or it's guns only. Oh. <laughs> and so, because we said, hey, come on, let's mix it up. And, the, and even yeah. way back then, the uh, the F-15 guys, they ran great intercepts. They had great SA. And so as a Rio, I mean, this is my job, but I'm listening to these F-15 pilots. I'm going like, man, these guys are pretty good, you know. And part of that, I'll get, I'll tell you the reasons I think that, that, that uh, they were good. Part of it was they had a good radar with medium PRF process. Yeah. Yeah. The F-14A radar uh, required a lot of operator attention and and it to to do its best job. And another part was uh, Air Force training. I uh, I learned as I worked with when I went to Top Gun and we had our first Air Force Exchange officer, Captain Mike Strait, call sign Boa. He had you know a high level of uh, execution, and I think while all these Navy guys at Top Gun, you know, we were, we were very, we we're capable and professional, but I think BOA helped us to improve our intercept game. Uh -huh. um, and so did some of the new Hornet guys. And again, it, at the time it, it pained me as an F-14 Rio to list, to, to uh, <laughs> get these tips from these guys, but I'm going, well, you know, I, I know a good idea when I see one. And uh, uh, yeah, on the other hand, yeah. the, the Navy did, uh, the Navy stepped up, and in my my opinion, you know, the Navy improved its execution greatly in terms of intercepts. Boy, I'll tell you what, I could be pissing off a whole lot of people by by going down this line of commentary. But you know what? That's what starts conversations, man. You know that? It doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it. Well, and, and know, that's my opinion. And every once in a while, Sluggo, every once in a while, I do talk to somebody and, and they go, I forget you forgot this or remember this and go like, oh, oh yeah, okay, you're right. <laughs> so, I don't mind admitting, you know, oh yeah, I forgot that. Yeah, but I mean, look at the transition that the the F-14 made because I remember during this exercise that we had with CAG-5, yeah. we had a live drop range at Kadena that people would come down and use. And that was one of the big things that they wanted to do was because this was in uh, 94, 95 timeframe, and they were just oh, okay. starting to drop bombs off of yeah. cats. Yep. And so a wall of eagles was set up in front of them. They'd have to fight their way through. They'd go in, drop their bombs, turn around, fight the eagles on the way out. And they were loving life. Matter yeah, of fact, the, the, the battle group training. admiral. Yeah, exactly. That's great training. And matter of fact, the battle group admiral says, we got to do this again. And we were using the North Korean ROE. And we got to exercises and figure out, hey, there's a hole here, there's a hole here, there's a hole here. We got to plug. Yeah. The, the two Tomcat squadrons were uh, the Black Knights and the Lancers. Yeah, twenty one and, and one fifty four. Those. Yeah. And, and and see, when you say Air Wing five, you know any uh, any Navy guy or Tomcat guy knows that's the Air Wing that was based in Japan for and still is. And still is. Since yeah. uh, probably the late nineteen seventies, it's a forward deployed, uh, forward based Air Wing. And again, we did something that had never been done before where we brought the whole battle group down. Uh -huh. And one of the guys at CAG-5, one of the CAG-5 uh, strike leads is gone. 
you know, we've never done this before. I said, well, here's our 17 training objectives. What do you guys want to do? And they're going 17. You got 17. I go, yeah, here they are. Look. And they go, can we put this in and can I put this in? Can we put this in? And we said, absolutely. Let's come down and do it. And so for four days, we fought this air campaign, CAG-5 as obviously orange air bad guy for us, but we were bad guy for them. And they'd have to yeah. fight through a bunch of F-15s, drop their bombs, and then fight their way back out. And yeah. it was great training because here's the other thing. Some of the brand new nuggets and LTs in the air wing had never plugged into a KC-135. Oh, yeah, of And got oh, to yeah, do it course, for the first yeah. time. Sure. And got to do it for the first time. Yeah. I told them, you guys can have three KC-135s during the day. Whenever you guys need them, you just tell us when you want them to launch and, and they're on station time. And that was one of the other things that battle group admiral said, holy smokes, this is a terrific training. We got to do this again. And I left before we got a chance to do it again. But uh, So that was 94, 95? Yeah. And the other was, thing that we did too, Bio, is we brought the Rios and the pilots from the F-18 squadrons and the F-14 squadrons to Kadena, and they got to fly in the backseat of the 15s. And the 15 pilots got to go out to the boat, excuse me, the carrier, no, I'm good. <laughs> I know. I got to be careful using that term. They don't like they, they don't like boat, but they got to go out to the carrier and fly in the F14 in the back seat of the F14. And they all oh, came great. back saying they all came back and saying, "Man, I've got a different appreciation for how these guys do their work." Good. I think that's where that interoperability lesson learned comes from is doing work like that and doing things like that. Oh, the other thing, the F15s were simulating cruise missiles and we're trying to get at the carrier through the Asia screen. Yeah. I think one guy got through during the four days. All right? Interesting. That's that good. was, that was humbling to them. Okay. Oh, that's good. And we told the F-14s that when we were doing the cruise missile stuff that they could use Phoenix. Okay. And yeah. all of the 15 guys came back and were humbled by how that turned out. Cause they thought, oh, I'm going to go at 50 feet. I'm going to, you know, at the mock 50 feet and everything like that got wasted before they got within 30 miles. Yeah. Yep. And they all had this greater appreciation of how you do fleet defense. Okay. So good. Everybody learned something. Yeah, they really did. Okay. So describe for our listeners, when you talk about fleet defense, what does that mean? And well, how back, is it done? You know, this is a case where uh, back in the eighties, seventies, eighties, uh, the threat, the, the high level threat was the Soviet Union and waves of uh, bombers accompanied by jammers and the bombers carrying cruise missiles that could fly 200 miles or more. And so uh, and when I say waves of bombers, you know, I think it was probably 18 was a small raid or something like that. And and the Tom and, and of course, we didn't know exactly when they would attack. We didn't think, you know, we would we would know exactly when we'd have some kind of tipper information and what indications and stuff. And so the plan was to set up a big defensive grid of Tomcats out on station uh, waiting for the bombers to show up and the Tomcats would probably have, you know, realistically, they probably have four Phoenix missiles because you could probably just bring four back to the ship. Yeah. <clears throat> and you might have a few Tomcats out there. You might run through a few cycles before the bombers showed up. So you may not shoot any of those Phoenix, but they would be out. I'm reluctant to talk about actual distances, but, you know, you'd have, you know, half a dozen Tomcats out beyond a hundred miles hundreds of miles, depending on the exact posture and situation. And they'd be out there on station orbiting and, and looking and uh, waiting for a tipper information. And then, so when we're practicing this, or not waiting for tipper information, I'm sorry, yeah. waiting, waiting for the first contact. And one of the hardest things about practicing this was uh, discipline in terms of maintaining station and keeping people are keeping them with enough gas to respond to the threat and return to the carrier. And this was something that I taught. Uh, this is one of my side projects when I was a Top Gun instructor, because in the 80s and starting in the 70s, uh, Top Gun had a carrier air defense, uh, a small carrier air defense program. Most of the mm -hmm. Top Gun school was uh, air to air, close in air combat and, and air intercepts. But they they did 
address the carrier air defense mission. And, and I was on that team. I think all Rios were on that team. And so we would teach fleet guys, you know, how to defend the carrier. And we put them in simulators and we run them against these very challenging scenarios, things that you could not duplicate in real life. That's why we did it in the simulator because you couldn't get that many targets and that many jammers out there in real life. Uh, so we'd run these guys in the simulator. And then when I would debrief them, every once in a while, somebody would say, you know, oh, this is a doomsday mission. If I need to do whatever it takes to run out, to, to, to shoot down the bombers. And if I run out of gas, that's the way it goes. And I go, I, I don't think so. Yeah. You know, there's only 20, 22 Tomcats on that carrier. And you don't know if the war is going to last, you know, six hours or six weeks. But you don't want to start. It's, it's not like, you know, Grumman. Hellcats, where they were rolling off yeah. the assembly line 50 per day. You don't want to start dumping Tomcats in the ocean on the first, you know, at the first mission. So I go, you need to get out there, do the job and bring that plane back to the carrier. It was a complex mission. Uh, it was difficult to train to. And thank goodness we never had to do it for real. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. And I remember being up there at uh, Top Gun and, and going through their syllabus and seeing some of the things that they had some pretty scary comments about intercepting bear bombers. Was that something you got oh, to experience? You got to get up close to a bear bomber? A couple you did. Times? I, I, yeah. Almost everybody did. I, I actually, uh, being a uh, Pacific fleet guy, I made five deployments and they were all in the Pacific. And one of the downsides, if there was one was that we did not see, uh, quite the level of, uh, of Soviet. Again, this was back in the eighties. It was Soviet. Yeah. We didn't see the level of Soviet bombers that a lot of Atlantic fleet guys saw. But I did see, uh, I think I saw at least one bear, maybe a couple of bears. I saw a lot of IL-38 Mays, which were frankly, they got boring really fast. But they, <laughs> the cool part about it was when you're briefing these guys, of course, being a new Rio, I had a more experienced pilot. And uh, they put new pilots with more experienced Rios and so there would always be stories. There would always be, you know, somebody in the crew had probably seen a bear before and they would say, be careful with these guys. Don't let them put you in a box. When you're escorting them, watch their airspeed, watch what they do, because you'll be flying wing on them and they'll be pulling the throttles back. So you may join up on them and they're doing 300 knots indicated or something like that. And then pretty soon they're going, you know, 280, 260. <laughs> Pretty soon you're on the verge of stall. I mean, a 260 is not a Tomcat stall speed, but yeah. it's starting to get slow. And then they would say, watch out because they'll make a hard turn into you. And while you're trying to avoid them, then you'll depart your airplane. And so we were always wary of them. Um, and I didn't see any guys do any, you know, mean things like that yeah. when I was on them. But over the years, uh, there were reports that it did happen. Uh, and so you had to be you had to be careful, but also there's some excitement going like, hey, this is our actual enemy. You know, those guys in there, they're Soviet bomber pilots. Sometimes uh, carriers would try to deceive them by using either an unusual route because, you know, most carriers leaving the United States uh, went either to Pearl Harbor and then the Philippines or went from San Diego to the Philippines and they, you know, steamed a great circle route, yeah. plus or minus. But every once in a while, you would you would use deceptive tactics to try to make the carrier hard to find. Uh, and over the years, there were stories of, you know, Soviets being unable to find a carrier or having a hard time finding it or whatever. So every once in a while, you know, things would get get more serious. And, and that's kind of fun being a young lieutenant, uh, you know, playing real world games. Yeah. And seeing a real world enemy. Yeah. What, what that must have been like the first time. I, I would have um, thought, man, that has sent chills down your spine. You know, wow, this is the oh, guy. It was, it was, it was very cool. Away. It was very cool. And the things that you remember are you, uh, one, you, they told you make a lot of notes. So I'm sitting there writing things down, you know, like numbers on the airplanes. Then I had the, uh, the intelligence center, they'd give us their, their big clunky camera and you were taking pictures of everything with their camera. You're tracking, um, uh, I mean, the, either the E2 or the carrier is always tracking where you are, what's going on. And so you're, it's, it's, uh, it's a very busy time when you're escorting an enemy airplane around a carrier. 
because, you know, if he starts to come close to the carrier, the carrier starts, you know, getting all excited. And uh, it's just, it, it was fun. It was, uh, yeah, it did jazz you up. And my recollection is my my first one, the guy came down and, and we knew he was coming for hours ahead of time. And I launched on a regular scheduled event. Mm -hmm. But the most exciting way to launch would be an Alert 5 launch where you're sitting on the flight deck and all of a sudden they say, launch the alert fighters or launch the alert five, man, you start up the plane. Everybody starts running around on the flight deck and stuff. We could get airborne in about five minutes or a little less than five minutes back then. Uh, and that was just a heck of a way to, to uh, begin a flight. And it was, it was a test of everything you knew. It was a test of, you know, your systems knowledge, your carrier operations procedures and everything. Uh, and it was a heck of a lot of fun. You know, Sluggo, I say it was a heck of a lot of fun. Go ahead. You, I'll let you ask the question. But. Well, it was like being on nuclear alert and strategic air command in my tanker, man. I'll bet. You know, we're going to get airborne in basically five minutes with six nuclear armed FB 111s coming up behind yes. us, heading to wherever. It's the same kind of thrill. Okay. And oh, I remember exercise reading this that. a lot. I think you had one chapter in uh, in your book where you went into detail about that. And that was very exciting. You made that, you made that very exciting. You know, I've had people call me go, you didn't really launch, did you? <laughs> uh, no, we didn't. You know, and there's a little blurb at the very end of that chapter that, you know, I say, hey, this actually happened this way, but we didn't launch. Yeah. But we had a Soviet sub that was up close and yeah. we were on runway alert, you know. No, that and, was good. And so I, I understand that excitement that you get when you... You know, you're in the airplane, all of a sudden you're flipping switches and you're taxing up to the cat and off you go, you know, yep. and you're listening to, okay, where am I going? How am I getting there? You know, yeah. and of course, gas is always an issue, you yep. know, and it was just one of those things that uh, I understand the excitement of five minute alert on the carrier deck because we went through the same thing in SAC. Yeah, but, uh, yes. it was uh, it was a good test. And what I was going to say, the reason I say it was fun is because I remember thinking this uh, about some of the stuff I faced when I was a student at the Top Gun class. Yeah. I was trained and prepared to face this. So I remember sitting there, you know, sitting on station with one of two F-14s. So my pilot and I and our wingman, and we're uh, we know there's going to be four, six or more fighters out there. We didn't feel any trepidation. We're sitting there going like, okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, oh, awesome. uh, yeah, I'm going to pat you on the back, but I'm going to punch you in the face at the same time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It was awesome. I met my wife during that time period. Okay. And uh, a lot of people ask me, well, how did you meet your wife? And I said, uh, I met her at a party. I didn't want to go to, I stood her up on our first date and our courtship involved nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was an incredible time to be in the military. Incredible time, particularly during the Reagan era. Yeah. We were getting all kinds of new systems and new airplanes. And 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 look at us now. We're still flying those same airplanes. Okay. It's, it's funny you mentioned your wife because I met my wife. Top Gun class started on a Monday morning. Yeah. I met my wife the Thursday before Top Gun How? class started. How did you meet her? I met her in a bar. <laughs> did you? Yeah, Down one of my buddies. Diego? Yeah, of all the times. And so for the next five weeks, you know, we were dating and spent a lot of time together. And I was going to Top Gun class every day. So my life was full oh, man. <laughs> at that time. So you're going through this intense syllabus. And then at night, you're yeah. uh, spending time with uh, your yep. future wife. That's pretty incredible. Oh, it was cool. Oh, that. I'll bet. But, you know, it, let's see, that was uh, 1982. I had just turned uh, 24. That's awesome. And see, <laughs> you know, we I don't talk about what the wives experience a lot on the on the podcast, obviously. But every once in a while, it's really cool to find out, OK, how did you meet your wife? And of course, you're going on these long deployments and you've got little babies at home and you're going to be gone for six months or something yeah. like that, you know? Yeah. You know, at least we'd come home like in 80 days. You guys would be out forever. And mom's at home basically raising the family and and you're talking to her maybe on the phone every once in a while. Uh, yeah. It's completely yeah. different for you 
folks in the Navy. Well, and I'll tell you what, when we dated, there was no email and a letter took 10 days, 10 days to get back and forth. And, you know, we maybe we're both independent or something, but we both adjusted to that. We go, oh, that's fine. You know, we dated for I met her in August. We got married the following March. And (laughs) during that time period, I was going on alert. And we were doing off-station trainers too. Man, you, I, I waited two years before I asked my wife because I go, you know, several of my buddies are getting married and I go, I don't want to just do it be, because everybody expects me to do yeah. it. So I waited and she goes, yeah. I was getting tired of you waiting. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't. There's a 10 year age difference between my wife and I. She was uh, 19 and I was 29 when we met. There's a lot of eyebrows raised when they saw that. Uh, we've been married for 34 years now. So 35 years. So it's, it's all good. The funny thing is we've been married. Yeah. We've been married. uh, Now your audience is going, what's this talk? We've been married 35 years, but my wife is still 29 years old. So I can't figure that out. So. Yeah. (laughs) So is mine. So tell our listeners how you get uh, chosen for Top Gun because everybody sees the movie and we'll talk about the movie here in a little bit, you know, yeah. they're standing in front of CAG, you know, after getting in trouble and uh, you two are going to Top Gun because somebody else turned in their wings. I'm sure that's well, not how that happens. For many years, the squadron commander selected who he wanted to send to Top Gun as a mm-hmm. student. And so he would normally pick his, uh, a, a good pilot in Rio uh, and, and, uh, pilot in Rio who had uh, a good prospect of coming back to the squadron and training the other air crews yeah. because that was the top gun model for many years. Yeah. And so when I was, uh, you know, when I was a junior officer, my pilot, excuse me, my commanding officer, I was his Rio, which in this case worked out well. He selected me to go through top gun and he selected one of the other junior pilots. Now, you know, being his Rio, if I, if I did a crappy job or whatever, it would not have worked out well, but yeah. it, things worked out well. So he selected me and uh, one of the junior pilots and we went through the Top Gun class. Later in that turnaround, our squadron actually got a second quota. And so he picked, you know, another pilot in Rio and they went through the Top Gun class also. So then again, this is back in the old days. And I didn't know this. I didn't know this until I became an instructor, but Top Gun was looking at the pilots and Rios that went through and they made, you know, they made notes at the end of the class. Who would we like to have come back as an instructor? And so they kept their list, which was very secret. And if you, you know, just expressed an interest is is the way it happened for me. I went back and uh, I I just got an itch in my brain about about a month after I went through the Top Gun class. I was going, I wonder if I could go back there and be an instructor. So I went I asked one of the former instructors in our squadron, I'll, I'll tell you this detail. He told me, he goes, well, Bio, he goes, what did they say to you when you graduated? So I thought back to the graduation ceremony. And after the end of the graduation ceremony, uh, there's a, a small formal ceremony. Mm-hmm. And then the instructors and the students went through, it's similar to baseball team when you're a little kid, you know, shaking hands at the end of the game. Yeah. You, you have two lines. So at the end of the ceremony, uh, we shook hands with a lot of the instructors and several instructors said, well, Bio, if you want to come back as an instructor, just let us know. And I hadn't even given that a second thought because I'm going, oh, they're just, I thought they were just saying that to be nice. <laughs> but, but when this guy, asked, this guy said, well, what did they say to you when you graduated? I told him this and he goes, well, you ought to go over and talk to him then. Yeah. So I went over and talked to him and they, you know, I went, over to the squadron and talked to the squadron, the Top Gun CEO and another uh, Rio who was there. And they said, yeah, they go, if you want to come here as an instructor, all you, what you have to do is change your officer preference card, which was our, our request, what we wanted to do in our next job, and then get your, your Tomcat squadron CEO to light, write a letter of recommendation. And so I did that, that started the process. And then, you know, when it was my turn to rotate, I ended up joining Top Gun as an instructor. And the reason I don't mind telling you all this is that the entire process has become much more formalized, Sluggo. <laughs> and which I which I think is is good for the Navy. Um, and it's described in Brad Elward's big giant book, Top Gun: The Legacy. He goes into great detail about how Top Gun instructors are chosen and and all of that. And it's a lot more formal than it used to be. 
which uh, again, I think that's that's a good idea as in the big picture. Yeah, see, weapon school is a is a is a selection process, putting in a package with recommendations, and you know, I was on the initial cadre. Actually, I staffed the package to create the KC-135 school and nobody wanted us, nobody, particularly Air Combat Command, which runs the weapon school. Yeah, and of they, course, because it's something different, something new. Yeah, you know, why would we want Air Mobility Command airplanes to be part of this? And I don't know if you know this now, they actually have a space school and an intercontinental ballistic missile squadron in the weapon school. I mean, it has expanded like crazy. Well, much to our credit. Okay? Yeah. And some people, you know, some people may dismiss or, you know, it's fun to make fun of those things. But if you look at the essentials of why a weapons school succeeds, not only Top Gun, but the Air Force Fighter Weapons School has, you know, very successful. If you look at the essentials and you distill them and redirect them and you can apply them to a different situation, there you go. So yeah, you, absolutely. Why not? Yeah. So. I got to ask you, Okay, how did you guys find out that Top Gun, the movie, was coming to you? <laughs> and what did you guys think when you were told, hey, you're going to be part of a movie? Okay, I'll, I'll again, I'll be real honest with you uh, because, <laughs> because it's so funny. So the movie is based on an article that was in California Magazine in, I think it was 1983. And and the entire article I worked with, the, the article is about a pilot in Rio going through the Top Gun class as students. And I worked with that pilot a few years ago, and we put the article on my website, topgunbio.com. So if you if you go on to topgunbio.com uh, and look in my in the in the table of contents on the right, it says, you know, the original article or something like that. I've read the article. It's pretty good. Yeah, it is. It is a good article. It's a, it's a good article. You well, know. back in the, I didn't read it back then because I, I saw it in the magazine because, you know, California magazine was on bookshelves and everybody talked about it. And I go, why would I waste my time reading this? You know, I did it. <laughs> but I read it a few years ago when the guy sent it to me and we worked, we worked on it. And I go, oh, this is a very good article. So uh, the, the two producers, uh, Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer, they saw that magazine and they were inspired by the article. And they started a process that took almost two years to do all the preparation and get the Navy's approval. And so the first time I heard about it was in early 1985, a few months into 1985, people started saying, and it, it, there wasn't a lot of talk about it. I heard a little bit of murmur, there's going to there's gonna be a movie about Top Gun or there's going to be a movie about Miramar. Well, and I'm thinking, you know, it's not going to. It's not going to be a big deal. (laughs) It's not going to have much to do with me. And there had already been, you know, some scenes filmed, like from from other movies and TV shows, and they didn't make any big impact. So it's like, whatever, this will be just the the next splash in the puddle. So then these guys show up. We start to get the sense, you know, oh, this is a big, big deal project. And so, you know, pretty soon it it's there. People start showing up asking, or when I say people, I mean writers. Writers start showing up and asking us questions. Uh, a few actors showed up now and then, but but when Tom Cruise came on base, we we're going like Tom Cruise was. What was he? He was in uh, all the right moves, or so. I mean, we didn't really. He wasn't a star. <laughs> And everybody, you know, I knew Michael Ironsides from the TV show V, and I had forgotten that Tom Skerritt was in MASH. So, you know, that they, they just really, they weren't major stars. Suddenly, you know, everybody shows up and then we start going, okay, you know, next month we're going to plan to film and and people start making preparations and things are really happening. And then I'm going like, okay, this is really here. But again, I had no concept that it would even be a successful movie, much less a hit. I don't think anybody did, Bio. Yeah. And that a Navy was good. Movie, a Navy movie about airplanes? Huh? What? You know what? That made life simple. How so? There were, there were no expectations. <laughs> there, was, there was no pressure. 
nobody really worried about, you know, I took my camera up a few times and took a few pictures. I, I talked to guys that were involved in making the new movie, which by the way, I think the new movie is, is great. They did a very nice job, but guys said that, Oh, we were supposed to leave our cell phones, you know, at the gate when we came onto the base or various things like that. And, oh, you know, I helped them to fly in the movie, but I can't say anything about it. And just like, whatever. OK, fine. <laughs> yeah. And there was so much expectations with the new movie. But when yeah. we made ours, it was like, you know, simple. Oh, I know. But, and, but and still, the, the Paramount me. people from the cameramen, the sound men, they were very professional and they tried to do a good job. And I think, you know, that helped to make it a good movie because it's a high quality movie. Oh, it really is. The original. Going it back really to the is. original. So I got to tell you something funny about that. All right. I was wearing a Top Gun hat when I met my wife. <laughs> okay. Uh, an F-14, I build plastic model planes and an yeah. F-14 Tomcat kit came with a hat in it. It wasn't the hat like you guys were okay with the light blue and everything. Okay. But I had it. No, on. I know the hat. I, I still have, I think I have a box of that F 14 model kit. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's it. Where this is, this is the F five. Yeah. And the reason, and I remember when they were, there's this one has a top gun patch yeah. offer on the back of it. And the reason I have this is because uh testers model corporation used some of my photos. Oh, wow. And they sent me uh, several kids. models and my name's on the back of the box. Photos from Lieutenant Dave Baronic. <laughs> so, okay. So you got your Top Gun hat. I had my Top Gun hat on at the party. I met my wife <laughs> and she and her girlfriend looked and said, oh, this guy doesn't fly airplanes. This guy, you know, what a loser, you know, what a wannabe, a Top Gun wannabe. Of course, she asked one of my friends, you know, what does he do? He's wearing that stupid Top Gun hat. Oh, he's a garbage man for crying out loud. He goes around and collects people's garbage. That's, that's exactly what Sammy said to, the, to him. OK. On our first date, I, I remember I, I told you I stood her up on our first date Friday night. I called her Saturday morning. I said, hey, I'll come get you and we'll do something. I, I won't drive you to New York. We we're living in Boston at the time in Portsmouth, yeah. New Hampshire. Yeah. I won't drive it in New York, but you know, we'll go do something. It took me two hours to find her house because there's no <laughs> GPS, right? There's no cell phones. Okay. Right. So I finally get to the house and everything. And I go, well, you know, what would you like to do? She goes, I want to see your airplane. And I said, okay, not thinking anything of it. And during the ride back up to Portsmouth to the base, I realized she doesn't believe I fly airplanes. <laughs> she doesn't believe I fly airplanes. Okay. That's funny. Yeah. So I go on base, of course. And remember we had the stickers in the window. And yeah. the, the guard salutes and she goes, why did he do that? And I said, well, I'm an officer. Well, how can he tell? Well, the sticker right here in the window. And I took her to the maintenance hangar. The DCM, the colonel, the 06 for uh, maintenance on the base was walking out with his wife and his in-laws. And he said, uh, hey, believe it, Valerie, I flew with him last week. And he says, hey, isn't your tail number 8887? 8887? I go, yeah. And he smiles, take her to the other side. And there it was, it was all taken apart, but 8887 was there. And I walked around to the left side excuse me, right side of the airplane. I didn't even look up. I just pointed. I said, not only do I fly airplanes, I've got my name on one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And she kissed me on the first date on the airplane. Uh, <laughs> nice. But I had one of those Top Gun hats on from one of the, one of the model kits. If only it was always that simple. Huh? Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> only if it was that, that simple, you know, but. Okay. Uh, I got it. I got a story about a name on an airplane, but this is about my mom. When my mom came out to San Diego early in my career, yeah, I showed her my name on an F-14 and they, they painted uh, Lieutenant JG Dave Baronic. And I showed my mom, I go, mom, look, my name is on an F-14. And she goes, your name is David, not Dave. <laughs> I go, thanks mom. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks for bringing me down, mom. So for the rest of my career, whenever they painted my name on an airplane, I told them to be sure to paint David on it. So. But see, it's <laughs> the little funny little reality. stories. Well, it's the funny little stories like that, you know, that make aviation so cool. You know, your name is not Dave. It's David. Yeah. My son. You know? <laughs> How many flights did you go up on during the actual filming of the movie where you're one of the one of the MIGs? Oh, I've got that. Uh, yes. As a, as a backseater, 
at Top Gun, I only flew one type of airplane. We had uh, the only two seaters we had was the F five F. What we also had single seat A four Skyhawks, but Top Gun didn't have any two seaters. The adversary squadrons did, but Top Gun didn't. We so we had single seat A four Skyhawks, and then we had single seat and two seat F fives. I flew in the F five F. Uh, when they painted them up for the movie, they painted three single seaters and one two seater. They painted those black. And so I flew in that two seat F 5F three times to uh, film flights for the movie. And I actually, I've got my log books over there, and I actually uh, went into my log book and I wrote Top Gun movie after those three flights. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one little note that I. Uh, that was one little note, you know, that I did realize, okay, maybe we're doing something interesting. But um, on one of those flights, we, let's see, we we filmed where we were the so-called MiG-28, MiG and uh, Maverick was inverted above us, and we looked up. That was like, you? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> now, now, they had filmed that scene earlier, but they said they, they weren't happy with it. And so I think that's me in the movie doing that. And then on another one of those, and then we did some other stuff. We did tail chase where we're chasing the uh, F-14. We had like uh, all four of the black F-5s out there and everybody had an altitude band. And so we're just weaving back and forth behind the Tomcat and the Tomcat's behind the Learjet. And so that was, you know... That was kind of interesting. None of this flying was was as demanding, as dynamic as a regular Top Gun flight. Yeah. But it was just kind of cool just being out there, you know, filming a movie, flying around a Learjet and yeah. worrying about that stuff. But you guys had to brief this like crazy, didn't you? Because oh, obviously, oh, yeah, we Bruckheimer's trying to choreograph all of the scenes and you're kind of have to follow his script. The briefings and the debriefings must have been incredible for this. So it was a multi-stage process. They had the script, you know, written, and that was the work of, of multiple people. And the Top Gun liaison officer, Rat Willard, he had a lot of input into the script, as did several other Navy officers. So then when they when they were doing the flying scenes, Rat and Bozo Abel, I think, was involved in this, would get together with the director, Tony Scott, and they would talk out the flying scenes. And, and Tony had done had drawn uh, storyboards. And Tony is a good artist, besides being a, uh, a film director. He was able to draw these detailed images to show the camera angles that he wanted and the action and stuff. So then Rat and Bozo would translate it into executable maneuvers. And then we would brief them. Uh, then it became a regular flight brief, you know, takeoff time, radio frequency, operating area. And then they'd use the models and the whiteboard, and they'd say, okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do, okay, Rat and Bio, you're going to fly by the Learjet, and they're going to film you looking up. And while they're doing that, the other MiGs are going to be hanging out with the F-14 just out of the way. Then we're going to break up, and the two F-14s are going to go to the west, and the MIGs are going to go to the east and we're going to do head on passes. So, you know, it was a regular flight brief and I would write down, you know, first event, second event and all that. As I said, it wasn't as dynamic as a Top Gun training flight. But when we did things like those head on passes, we flew much closer than we would during a training flight. So we were flying, you know, head on to the Tomcats and we're passing by around uh, around, excuse me, around 100 feet separation. Uh, it was very close, very exciting. And then when that's not in the training rules. <laughs> well, you know how we rationalize that? Yeah, oh. you, the training rules is 500 feet. Yeah. And we we did that first and Tony Scott goes, "Oh, that's too far. You're you're just going to be a speck." Well, we said, "Well, we're not doing um a dynamic ACM training flight. We're doing a closely choreographed, you know, filming flight." But still, Sluggo Nobody wants to get killed filming a darn movie yeah, or, or break a jet doing that. And yeah. so, you know, some of the other, uh, they, they then went up to Fallon to film uh, the Top Gun class flights. And those guys had to fly low, fly near the camera. And that was also very challenging because they were, 
because of the speeds and altitudes they were flying at. But they got some great footage. Oh, yeah. When those F-14s are flying over that like rocky outcropping, you know, the big spikes like that. Oh, my yeah. gosh. The that was some inc- yeah. 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 Uh, that was some incredible footage. OK. Oh, so, I agree with you. Yeah. So finally, they wrap all this up and make a movie out of it. And you got to go to the premiere, didn't you? You and your wife got to go to the premiere, didn't you? We went to the West Coast Benefit premiere. There was some premiere in Washington, I think. So they had to, you know, honor the uh, Navy admirals who supported the project and stuff like that. That's fine. So then they had a West Coast Benefit premiere in San Diego and uh, tickets were $50 per person. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was a lieutenant, that was a lot of money. That was a lot of money. Why would I want to pay? So anyway, Hughes Aircraft bought tickets for all the Top Gun instructors. So that was very nice. So we all went and sat, we rented limos. We went and sat in a group. Uh, It seemed like most of NAS Miramar was there. I mean, a lot of people were there. The theater was packed. They cranked the sound way up. It was just, uh, I actually, I don't remember much about the evening. It was just, but it was a big event. Then we went to a big party at uh, at a hotel a couple of blocks away. And then the next day, you know, I could look in my little book, but the next day, uh, at least this happened when I went up to, to, to Hollywood, I had to be at work at 7 a.m. It's like, <laughs> hey, my, real life goes on. And yeah, your movie came out, but Top Gun training needs to get done. Yeah, so, we got students here. We're, yeah. But that must have been so much fun to be part of that. It was fun. And, and we had, you know, a steady stream of magazines and uh, entertainment this week or whatever the program was called. And TV news shows, some national, some local, you know, they came by the squadrons and yeah. So yeah. And that was kind of fun. My fellow instructors, I will give them credit because we would swap stories about this when, when, when people would complete their interview or whatever, and everyone tried to be professional. They knew that they were representing the top gun and the Navy and U S military and they would say, you know, they, they, the interviewer tried to get me to say this and we'd all, you know, make a face and they go, I'm yeah. not going to say that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, there's uh, no love lost to the military and the media in some places, isn't there? <laughs> well, you know, back in, in 1986, I, I think things changed uh, after Gulf War one. Yeah. I mean, I, I uh, there's yes. The media is, still has a potential adversary relationship. But in 86, Top Gun was really like one of the first, as you said uh, earlier, when we were talking about the movie, it's like, what, a movie about the military, about airplanes? Who cares about that? And so it was one of the first, you know, big interactions between military and media. I mean, not the only one, but it was it was one of the few. Oh, it was huge, man. I, yeah. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing somebody with Top Gun gear on. Top Gun hats, you know, Top Gun shirts, Top Gun sweatshirts, oh, I, model airplanes for crying out loud, you know? I, I was I remember walking around Oceana, NAS Oceana. I was there on a training, on a training uh, for like two weeks of train uh, to give training. And I would, you know, I was just wearing a Top Gun squadron shirt because uh, we wore them now and then. And I remember walking around the Navy Exchange and this little kid goes, Mommy, look, that man's in Top Gun. His mother said... Son, these days, everybody's in Top Gun. (laughs) Boy. (laughs) You know, I didn't even, I didn't even bother to go, no, no, really, I am. But it's like, just let it go. I know. It's like my wife. No, you don't really fly airplanes. Well, yeah, actually I do. (laughs) (laughs) So you write a book about Top Gun days. Tell us about, uh, tell my listeners how that thought came into your mind to write a book. If I had thought about this, if I even had any inkling that I would write a book back in the day, I would have taken twice as many photos and twice as many notes, but I never, you know, I didn't give it any thought, but after I retired, it would have been probably a year after I retired. Yeah. I remember driving home from work And I was thinking, I'm going to write a magazine article about filming the Top Gun movie. And then within a minute, as I was thinking about it, I go, I'm going to write a book. 
And I went home and I told my wife and she goes, that's a good idea. Cause she goes, you know, you need a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so that Sluggo, and I'll say this for the benefit of anyone in your audience who is thinking about writing a book. It took me a total of three, almost three years to write this book. Now, I look back and I, I did, I saved each chapter as a separate file. I look back at the dates. During that three years, I took a couple of breaks. For example, I wrote the first three chapters and then I took six months off. <laughs> and what I did during that time is I was looking for a, a publisher. And, uh, and then I said, you know what? I need to get back to work. So I wrote more Then I, I kind of hit a block. I took three more months off and then I, I finished the book. Well, then it took a couple more years to get a literary agent. So it, for me, was a long process. Uh, I got a lot of rejections. And part of it was, as my agent said, when I finally got a literary agent, he goes, why didn't you write this 20 years ago? You know, you could have, <laughs> it would have been perfect. There were, you know, I talked to the Naval Institute, the, yeah. the people that put, put out proceedings and the yeah. Naval Institute Press. They were very gracious to look at my manuscript and they said, this doesn't fit any of our categories. And I heard that from another aviation publisher also. They said, if your book was about Vietnam or about the, or about not the Cold War, Vietnam, World War II, or, you know, this was by now is in 2005, 2006. They go, if it was about the war in Afghanistan or Iraq, we'd pick it up right away but you're writing about the Cold War. And they go, nobody's reading those books. So I had a hard time getting a publisher, but I finally did. <laughs> yeah, and you've written two more since then. Well, that's something else I, I never, I wasn't sure I would do. I, I wrote Top Gun Days. I felt good about that. And then um, another author, Wolfgang Samuel. Do you know Wolfgang Samuel? I he's don't. A former, he's a former Air Force navigator who I used to do book signings with at Smithsonian. He goes, Dave, you, he's written like uh, seven or eight books, and, and they're very good books. He goes, Dave, you need more than one book. So people used to ask me how I got started in the business. And so I wrote before Top Gun Days, which was about uh, the training and stuff like that. And and just realizing that, wait a minute, I kicked something down here. Just, oh, I'm good. Just realizing that, you know, training may not be exciting enough. I do include several stories from the fleet in before Top Gun days, because in my training, I freely admit this. You know, we talked earlier about what the Navy trained to, taught us and stuff like that, but it wasn't easy for me. I I did fine at it. I came, you know, I, was, I wasn't number one in my class, but I was near the top and clearly I had good enough grades to get through. But, but I, in that book, I admit, you know, yeah, I got a down in a simulator and I deserved it. You know, I get, I had a failing grade. And then um, I, anyway, I don't mind telling people that, that it, you know, it was, it was complex, demanding, but then I put these stories in at the end to show, well, eventually I did catch on, you know, and I, I was able to be a, a good Rio. So, and then I wrote Tomcat Rio. That was my newest book. Great book. And, and for me, well, well, thanks. That, that was for me, one of the most fun books to write because I was, I felt like I was representing myself. When I wrote Top Gun Days, I felt like I was representing the Top Gun Squadron. And in Tomcat Rio, I loosened up a little bit. I wrote, you know, a few more stories about parties and mistakes we made while flying and stuff like that. So, and in Tomcat Rio, I, I got the publisher to use bigger paper. So the pictures are much bigger. They look better. But also I, I read your book and I think that, uh, that it's got a lot more to it. You, you, you went a little further than I did. You explicitly drew out lessons from the cockpit. And, and I put a few things in mind and I thought I might do more of that. When I started writing, I go, you know, I'm just going to tell the story and I'll let people draw their own conclusions. Yeah. They can pull the lessons out. You know, they're yeah. in there. No, see Simon and Schuster, when I first sent in the manuscript, I had the lessons in a, in a different file. Yeah. And they went, Where's the lessons learned? We're not publishing yeah. this without the lessons learned. I said, oh, well, here they are. And they said, okay, good. And and off it went, you know, and it's not going to be like one of J.K. Rowling's book. And I said, I don't think it's going to be either, but it consistently sells. And I still get notes, and I'm sure you do too, which are really cool to get notes from people and read the reviews 
that say, hey, this book really moved me. This this yep. made me change the way I'm thinking about things. OK, yes, that is that is very rewarding for an author to uh, to get those. It really is. And so yep. I'm I'm happy that I I did it. I wasn't I had never thought about writing a book. And then finally, I made it my mind up to do it. And uh, I did my whole manuscript in about three, four months. So did you ever get to fly against the Red Eagle Bubba's? Oh, yeah. That's something that was was declassified while I was writing my book. I it didn't I wasn't comfortable with revealing that part of the story. So I did not mention it in my book. And and for years I still didn't talk about it until uh, last year I did a short video on uh, and on YouTube uh-huh. in my Tomcat Tomcat Memories series about my uh, flight. The first time I flew against them, uh, we flew against a MiG-21, and it was all 1v1 visual setups. Then uh, later, when I was a Top Gun student, we flew against them, and we did a, a visual and a performance demo against a MiG-23, and then we had a set, which was also 1v1, and then we had a second flight where we did 2v2 uh, intercept to engagement against a MiG-23. And I got to tell you, those floggers were fast, super fast. They could not maneuver against the Tomcat. So, you yeah. know, we got kills shortly after the merge. And that's they were very cool. Happened. Yeah. Did you ever get to see them? No, I, you know, we knew, we knew about it, you know, particularly when I was at Kadena because all the F-15 guys were cycling through the program, yeah. you know, when they would go out for what they called WESEP, uh, Combat Archer, you know, they'd sneak a yeah. couple rides in up there and uh against the 21 and the and the 23 and i knew about it but didn't know the constant peg name or anything like that you know but uh man it was it was it was a cool program (laughs) well and look at the dividends that paid over the long run too now not too long ago a couple years ago some photographer published pictures of a 16 and a flanker going at each other over the top of the Nellis range. Okay. Yeah. So program is alive and well, I guess. Something's Uh, going on. Something's going on. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The dividends that that pays to be able to go up against an instructor who really, really knows adversary tactics, flying the airplane that you're going to face is incredible. And I think that's why our military is so good because of the way we train. Yes. The way we train. I I agree with you. I hear people talk about flight hours. And of course, that's a very, that's a very coarse measure. It's, you know, there's quality flight hours and there's, but there's a lot to be said for flight hours. And as long as our aviators, pilots and whizzos and air crews and everybody get, you know, a good level of flight hours and they have good high quality training. I just think that's very important. It, it really, it, um, it balances, you know, things like quantity and various other things. Uh, so I, I, I always keep an eye on, on information like that whenever it's available. And I'm, I'm glad to see that they are, that other people are worried about that and keeping track of it because it's important. And you know what, when we were standing up our school, one of the yeah. things that we kept telling each other when we're, when we're working on the syllabus, and again, we're starting from a white sheet of paper Yeah. was train like you fight, fight like you train. Train like you fight, oh, yeah. fight like you train. Yep. Yep. Train like you fight, fight like you train. All of us had heard that. All of us had heard that Top Gun uh, moniker, that Top Gun motto. Uh, it saved us in many situations. You know, Yeah. hey, that's not the way we would employ this airplane. We're not going to include that. And uh, Very good. Thanks to you guys and and train like you fight, fight like you train. Well, and I've and I've got to I've got to thank Sluggo. You know, I I think back, and I actually do think stuff like this sometimes. Those first guys that set up the first Top Gun squadron, and their you know their names are known, Dan Peterson and his crew. They established these standards. I mean, they could have done they could have gone a, a hundred different ways, but they set very high standards for themselves. They made each other stand to it. And so they made each other uh, meet the standards. And so, I mean, they, they got it right. 
Yeah. And and as I said before, Air Force Fighter Weapons School, uh, same thing. I think, you know, both services had issues in, in the 60s. Uh, eventually, you know, everybody got, got on board and knew that they needed to do it correctly, as you've talked about. So, yeah. yep, we got to give one those of, guys credit. One of my favorite books is Scream of Eagles that talks oh, yeah. about the creation of Top Gun and what they had to go through, you know, from their totally little agree trailer, from their little trailer, what the school is now. And again, I, look what it's done. I've read Scream of Eagles two or three times, and uh, and I get stuff out of it every time. I love yeah, it. Absolutely. I think I've told you all the stories I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'll ask you one question, and go. this this one is a question that people go, "Ooh, wow!" Looking back on your career, what would be your top three lessons learned that you would pass to a brand new nugget? If you were standing in front of them? Oh, that's it. That is a great question. I can tell you one right off because it's something I wish I had done different. I wish I had asked more stupid questions when I was a new guy. And by that, I mean things like going out to the airplane and asking asking the mechanics, the, the sailors, the air framers, the mechs, the electricians, what does that do? How does that work? Show me how that worked. I wish I had done that more. I did a very little bit of it, but not much. You know, I studied my NATOPS and I thought, you know, I was able to, I knew enough, but I wish I had a deeper understanding. Another thing that I wish I had done differently is uh, at, at points along the way, I wish I had ask my fellow officers more about themselves because you're in a squadron with in an F-14 squadron, there's 30 or more other pilots and Rios. And you know a little bit about them, you know, what they're, where they're from, where they went to college and stuff. I realized there were a lot of things I didn't know about them and and uh, and I kind of wish I did. So I don't know if I can come up with a third thing because uh, I feel very fortunate the way my career yeah. turned out. Well, I noticed what you have on the back of your chair. CO. Yeah. When you leave the squadron, your ready room chair that has CO and your call sign, the squadron doesn't want that anymore. So they gave it to me and I put it on my office chair here and it fit. Yeah. <laughs> As the skipper of an F-14 squadron, what would be some of the leadership lessons you'd give to some of your aviators now if you were standing uh, in front of them? Well, that that's a that's a tough one for me because because I had not flown for quite a few years when I was selected to go back in command. So I had a lot of catching up to do, but, but that's, that is one of the cases where I wish I had asked my junior officers more about themselves specifically, because I had a general sense of each person, but I just, there's, I'm sitting there going like, man, I wish I had known, you know, this. On the other hand, I'm going to take credit for something I did. I, I got to know our, uh, our enlisted men and women fairly well. And that was a result of reading actually reading a complaint uh, when I joined the squadron as XO, see in the Navy, you join as the XO. And then you, after, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, you become the CO for another 12 to 18 months. And so it's a fleet up or rotation like that, which I think is a great system. And when I arrived as XO, they had just taken what was called a command climate survey where the sailors just get to complain and they, and everybody gets to read all their inputs. They're all uh, anonymous. And I read this one that said, the, the CO doesn't even know who I am. You know, I work so hard for him and for our squadron and he doesn't know who I am. So I took that on board and, uh, and I, I tried to get to know a lot of our sailors uh, and talk to them on a regular level. So I, I think I did that well. And I guess that's something I would tell junior people, you know, get to know your people. But see, that's, that carries over into business really well. Cause I went into the corporate world after I left the military and uh I had some leaders that had no idea who I was or who I knew and what I knew. Yeah. You know, and I had one guy come up to me and actually tell me, you know, you need to do what I tell you because I've been here longer than you have while we're trying to figure out what to put in a cockpit. And I turned around and I looked at him. I said, when you have 5,000 hours and multiple jet engine airframes, you'll have some street cred with me. Okay, Steve. And he looked at me like a, he was just shocked that I would even say that to him. Yeah. I said, I said, do you have any idea what my background is, Steve, who I am, what I've done? Not only did he not care, he, he just blew it off. Okay. Oh, and, even after you told him, oh, well, yeah, even after I told him that. And, wow. Uh, and I just kind of went, okay, well, 
that's the way it's going to be, I guess, you know, some people. Yeah. But I was made a systems engineering manager and I don't have a systems engineering degree, but I found out every one of the 12 guys and gals that work for me a little bit about their background. And it was huge because I could tell, I could say, Oh, he's got background in that. He would be really good for this project. Yep. And I think that was one of the things that I learned from being a systems engineering manager, you know, not for very long, but again, 12 people under me finding out, Hey, what's your background? What do you like to do? One guy loved woodworking. And as a matter of fact, has left the systems engineering world and is now a full-time woodworker in his garage. Oh, nice. That was one of the things, you know, when we put together the team to run tankers over Iraq for the shock and yeah. campaign, yeah. every person on my team was somebody I had intimate working relationship with. And we got together, we, we came together and worked together famously. And yep. it, it was, it, it was a thing of beauty, but that was only because I'd known who these people were and had spent time with them and understood their capabilities. There's a lot to be said for that. Yep. Isn't there? Well, brother, thanks. Thanks, well, for, being here thanks with me for having me. You know, when, when we talked, when we talked about this and I, and I uh, thought back about your book and, and uh, thought about your podcast and stuff, I go, this is going to be a little bit different. And be, because you do bring in this real world application uh, and stuff like that. So I've enjoyed talking about it with that in mind. And I'm going to put a link uh, to Amazon to all three of your books in the show notes. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> and um, this has talking with you and seeing your CO cover in the background, man, you were a part of a famous squatter. You're the CEO of a very famous squatter in 211. Holy smokes. Oh, the checkmates. Yeah, they're, they've are yeah. they been around a while. They did. They've got some uh, history. Yes. Well, I see but on you one know, of your helmets in the background, the red yeah. renegade check mark. Is that right? Well, this is from my first squadron, VF-24. Yeah, that's what I thought. The renegades, yeah. right? Yes. See, so you were and in this, some. You were in and this, some is, this is 211, my yeah. last helmet. But I don't put it on because the liner is starting to dry rot and it leaves stuff on my head. <laughs> So I was at Oceana in yeah. 2003 when 211 was transitioning from Tomcats oh. to the Super Hornets. Yes. And I have a picture somewhere of F-14s on one row and F-18s on another row, all painted in 211 markings. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's a very cool picture. That's a, that, that, was, that was a really interesting time to see, you know, out with the old, in with the new. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and of course, 211 had been over to the Gulf numerous times uh, after 9-11 doing certain things. So Flying was, their old F-14A models. Yeah, flying the F-14A models. But you know what? You know, they're carrying the lantern pod. You know, we talked about dropping bombs. Carrying the lantern pod and four GBU-12s, you know, smacking down caves and bad guys and things. I mean, it was it was really something. That gave the F-14 10 more years of useful service. So it that sure lantern did. pod was just great. Yeah. It, and uh, looking back on some of that, because every night at the, at the map cell meeting, we would show the greatest hits over Kandahar or the greatest <laughs> hits over Baghdad. Cool. And, and of course, we had a lot of F-14 lantern pod video that would come to us that was uh, fantastic stuff. So anyway. Good. All right, brother. Thanks again for being with me today and uh, the lesson from the cockpit show. And uh, like I said, I'll link to your books on uh, Amazon so that uh, people can just click on there and go right to them. All right. Well, thanks. And be, be sure to let me know when you put this up and I'll put it out on my network so you can get some more viewers. Okay. Uh, be up next week. We're going to do this one next week. Okay. All right. All right. Folks, this is what this show is all about. Talking to people like Dave Baronic, Bio, and hearing all these things about being at Top Gun. Can you imagine coming in and going, hey, you guys are going to be in a movie? How surreal would that be? Particularly one that nobody expected to do well and becomes one of the most iconic movies about aviation during the 80s. Thanks to all of my listeners once again for 
downloading this episode and previous episodes of the Lessons from the Cockpit podcast, which can be found on my website at marcusera.com. I hope all of you had a great holidays. I really do appreciate all of you downloading and listening to episodes of Lessons from the Cockpit. We're almost at 10,000 downloads, which is pretty good considering I've only been doing this for a year and uh, I'm hearing more and more from people around the world that are listening to my podcast. This and previous episodes of the Lessons from the Cockpit podcast can be found at my website, marcusera.com, under the podcast pull-down box. The Lessons from the Cockpit show is financially supported in all that we do from Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home office or hangar. I want all of you to go to wallpilot.com and take a look at some of the ready-to-print. I think there's 127 ready-to-print profiles there. They're extremely detailed. They've even got the arming handles on the Sidewinder missiles with the stenciling. We do a lot of research when we start drawing and constructing these airplanes. We do it all in Adobe. Illustrator. And of course, we do custom orders too. We did a 30 footer for one of our customers. So please go order one or two of our graphics. Or if you really have an airplane you want on your wall, we can do custom orders also with your name, weapons load, unit emblems, tail number on a custom print. I'm working on helicopters now. I don't know a lot about helicopters. I have two custom customers for helicopters, but you'll see those up pretty soon. Soon, the uh, SH-3 Sea King and the Apache Attack Helicopter. Folks, thanks for tuning in and listening today to this episode with Bio. Links to his books on Amazon will be in the show notes. And we'll look forward to talking to you again next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit show.